Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call the Marion Township Board of Supervisors meeting for March 25th, 2021 to order. The time is now 7.04 p.m. We are continuing to do these meetings through telepresence in light of COVID-19 and Governor Wolf's emergency declaration and stay-at-home orders. Uh, under normal circumstances, we would do the Pledge of Allegiance, but due to the nature of the, the telepresence, we are going to admit that for the time being. First act of the meeting is to approve the minutes of February 25th, 2021 for the Board of Supervisors meeting. I'll make a motion to approve. Do we have a second from either Jim or Irene? Hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you now. Now, roll call. Peter, aye. Irene, aye. Jim, aye. Okay. Next is to approve the minutes of the March twentieth, twenty twenty one workshop meeting. I'll make a motion to approve those minutes. I'll second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Next is to approve the payment of the bills for March 2021. Make a motion to approve payment of the bills for March 2021. I'll second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Peter, may I add a little bit of a caveat to that? Yes, I was actually, I had one too, just as a okay. as a quick side note for the, the financial reports that, that are uploaded. Okay. Is that what you were going to bring up or? Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't okay. see the financial reports, but Sue okay. um, made a good point uh, in an email today. Um, in the future, we will be including the taxes that are taken out for payroll um, and uh, I did not realize that that was being omitted because it just wasn't in the format through the reports. So that, um, the public will be seeing some additional money that is paid out monthly. That's actually, that was my, my asterisk on that one okay. was that there's a, there's a previously uncaptured element to the payroll. Yep. So it's the tax withholding that we just have to amend the report to include that. Okay. Yep. And also, and also the fee, the monthly fee. The, the jet pay, the, the administrative fees, which are small. That, that will small. be included from here on in. Yeah. Okay. At this time, I will open the floor to public comments. Uh, Sue, did we have any written comments via email or phone calls throughout the week? There were no emails, no phone calls. Okay. Thank you. Uh, does anybody on the call have a comment? I know, Kelly, you had called me before the meeting. Would you perhaps like this opportunity to, to raise the the comment through the, the public forum. If not, I can I can cover it if you're unable to, to get off of mute for one reason or another, grandkids or background noise or anything like that. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just gonna dive into it. If Kelly can get off, uh, off the, the mute, then I'll let her take over, but uh, uh, the there were several concerns that Kelly raised. First and foremost, uh, the question arose around the community yard sale. Um, with the current state of things, is this something that can still be held based on the, the kind of dispersed low volume attendance nature of the community yard sale? Or is this something that would be subject to supervisor's approval? I'm just wondering what happened. So Irene, Jim, Okay. If, if we look at um, CDC guidelines and what's also encouraged by PSATs, if you go to the PSATs website, they have some guidelines that they put out, and, and I believe it's the most up-to-date CDC guidelines. I understand that kids are going to be going back to school. My kids are going back to school starting April 19th. There's still recommendations to um, have restrictions on gatherings. Um, outdoor activities recommendation are less than our 20% of maximum occupancy. Of course, we can't control how many people attend the park and because it's an open space, there really isn't a maximum capacity. Recommendations are to continue to maintain a six foot uh, social distancing. Uh, I said all there, sorry, <laughs> six feet social distancing and maintain masks. And this is all both on the CDC website as well as PSATs if anyone wants to take a look at it. 
there's a lot of people in our community that still do not adhere to mask wearing and still do not adhere to um, the six feet social distancing. I don't know about you, small children definitely can't do it. If you're in a family unit, it doesn't really apply to you. But if you're now incorporating multiple children in the same area, I can't assure anyone's safety. So I can't encourage that kind of behavior. So this is something I still don't feel comfortable doing from the position that I'm in. I can't encourage people to come to the park knowing that small children will continue to play with each other. And I don't want to stop children from playing with each other, but we're still in the middle of the pandemic. I could tell you um, a little bit from my own personal experience, we're starting to see numbers bump up again. So even though some restrictions are being lifted, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a bump up, there's going to be a spike, and we're going to have restrictions put right back into place. So as a supervisor, I don't feel comfortable encouraging outdoor gatherings when we can't enforce people wearing masks and we can't enforce them keeping at, you know, the recommended distance from each other. I, I just don't feel comfortable being the source of a super spreader uh, event. Uh, forgive me, the lady who is there uh, from Kozlov Stout, I, I don't know your name. Sorry, Courtney. Um, Courtney, forgive me, Courtney. Um, I don't see your name up on, on my screen. Um, can you tell us what other townships are doing with respect to um, parks, et cetera? Sure. So um, everybody's had a different approach. Most of the parks are open at this point. Um, and then different municipalities are choosing whether or not they're, there's a difference between having a park open and having an event at the park. Most of them are now having the parks open, especially now it's spring. Um, and then if they do have events, they just incur they've just been doing things like having masks available, hand sanitizer stations, things like that, and encouraging um, individuals to to do it but we i will say parks are open i it, the whether or not they're hosting events in their spaces really depends on the municipality and the type of event um some and some you know that's also evolved as the restrictions have evolved so it like i said it really just depends on the event uh, but as of right now i think everybody i work with directly has their parks open but they do have signs up and they do take measures to try to limit risk. Yeah, and how do we all feel about supplying masks and how we can't keep the park clean, so to speak. We don't have to disinfect the playground. That's not what's recommended anymore, um, but maintaining the spaces, et cetera. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'd like to hear Jim's opinion and your opinion, Peter, but you know, even if we supply the masks, I don't think there's there's good compliance within our own community. If you go to the grocery store, if you walk around town, I mean, um, whatever you guys feel comfortable with. I'd, I'd love to open up the park. Um, I honestly, I, I haven't really monitored in the past how many children attend it. So if that's something that you guys feel comfortable with, we can't, we'd have to get signs to say, please wear masks, social distance, etc. Okay. So food for thought here regarding the park out of the, out of the equation of things, the, the only thing that I'm really kind of uncomfortable with is the little league i like the little league mm -hmm. i hope the little league continues to use our ball field but that's the only thing that i can think of that would use the space that would draw a large crowd of people um other than people doing like pickup games already on the baseball diamond things like that but again that comes down to the baseball aspect of it um most days there's not that many kids at the park at any one given time it's usually one maybe two family units of people there you don't have a huge number of people frequenting the park for various reasons, but the the cross contamination is is going to be, I think, kind of minimal there, especially if we're, we're not under the restriction of having to sanitize the equipment mm -hmm. between uses. Mm -hmm. um, the yard sale, again, I feel is low enough volume. We don't usually have that good of a turnout, if I can be <laughs> at all honest, where most people are going to be well outside of the six feet away from each other like sort of setback at any one given time other than potentially handing money to somebody for buying something. Um, so again, I think risk wise, it's, it's low risk on the actual play set itself <laughs> and for the, the, the yard sale. Um, I know, but, I don't see but uh, you know, if we were to get a couple of signs that said, you know, please wear masks or use playground equipment at your own risk. 
I, I guess maybe I feel a little bit better about that. Um, I, I really don't think we could adequately provide people with masks. Oh, no, I think the, log the logistics and the cost right. aspect of that is, is not something that's within our, our reach that like just to have a thing of like free take one for a mask and a hand sanitizer. I don't, I don't think that would, not gonna happen. That, would that would not work out particularly yeah. well. Um, Jim, what are your thoughts? Well, I kind of agree with you. I'd love to see the little league be able to use that field because kids don't have enough to do it. And, uh, and I'd love to see this, this happen. Is it possible that we could put a sign up that, uh, you know, keep, keep the distancing and wear a mask and allow the use of the park. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly within our, our purview to be able to do. The question is, do we do that for the park and continue to keep the ball field closed? Or do we get a couple more signs made up for over on the batting cage where we say like spectators must observe social distancing and wear masks. The enforcement of it is going to be difficult to, to borderline impossible. But if we're going to, if we're going to take the stance of open things back up, and give people the fair warning. That is something we certainly could do. I'm okay with the park. I'm not okay with organized sports. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, I'm kind of getting the, the read from the two of you that parks and yard sale are okay. Ball field with, is going to continue to be closed for the immediate future. Yeah. Okay. So I think I, we're going to, I'll, uh, I'll agree to disagree. <laughs> okay. Well, no, no, this is, this is the time for discourse, yeah. Jim, speak up, please. I, uh, I really don't see any problem with the baseball either. If, if someone's concerned about six feet distancing, they'll move away. And if someone is not wearing a mask, no one's going to go near them or they're going near them at their own risk. If we have signs up that indicate that. I just hate to shut down little league. These yeah. kids, I, right. I played Little League all my, all my young life, and I lived for it. I got up in the morning and played baseball and went home when the yeah. street lights came on from playing baseball. The, the, the problem is there's too much of a mentality in this in all over that I don't have symptoms, so I can't have COVID, or COVID isn't real. And this is what keeps on perpetuating this pandemic because people are not compliant with mask wearing. And I see this every single day. It's gotten to the point where I have people that are positive that look at me and say, you're lying to me. And I'm like, the science doesn't lie. I don't know what you want me to tell you. And so, you know, it, it, in a certain aspect, I feel very uncomfortable with encouraging larger crowds so because people don't want to wear masks it i think it's a little difficult to play sports in masks especially if you're outdoors and the weather's getting warmer so i don't feel comfortable with little league if peter's telling me that the park is frequented maybe by like one or two family units i don't have a problem with that if we had a very large uh group of individuals that attended the park routinely i would feel uncomfortable but i'm going with what peter's telling me about park attendance but i i, I can't encourage anything larger than maybe one or two family units going to the park at a time. We, I'm still seeing people there, you know, despite the fact that there's a sign that says park is closed. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. With that said, I do appreciate yeah. everybody who has actually observed the, uh, uh, one moment. See the yeah, somebody somebody spoke up in the chat. I'm just letting them know that we're, we're actually actively discussing a, a public comment at the moment. Um, yeah, the the little leak, like I said, is the only thing that concerns me. I'm, I'm admittedly I'm kind of 50 50. Part of me wants to say, like, yes, people should use sufficient prudence and good judgment and, you know, socially distance and everything like that. But the realist in me says that nobody's actually going to do that. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I so. guess when you're my age, you feel like <laughs> when it's your time, it's your time. I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Well, I mean, any, any COVID, of us could, COVID wouldn't touch me. anybody who leaves the house could get hit by a bus. That's, right. that's the cold hard reality of it. But right. um, I, I think we have to try to, to safeguard things. There comes a point where you can be overly cautious, but speaking honestly, I don't think we're, I don't think we're at that point yet. We're still within, I guess, good judgment and prudence on this based on what the, the guidelines and recommendations are. If other, other places are, are opening up, 
whether it's for right, wrong, or indifferent, the test of time may prove that they were they were right, or we may find that, as Irene said, we're at a point where restrictions start getting lifted and we're going to see a surge of cases. I, for one, don't want to be the one that has that hanging on my conscience of, yes, we opened this up and then suddenly all of the Little League got COVID. Yeah. And, I, and I defer to you and Irene's judgment. Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing, we're seeing more and more kids at organized sports getting COVID. Um, you know, it, it's, it's that 15 minutes that you have your mask down that you're close to someone. That's when, when you transmit it. And people that are asymptomatic still have COVID and we're just seeing a slow bump up in numbers until we're going to see another big surge again. So I'm fine with the park reopening. I couldn't comment really on the the um, community yard sale, because again, not having participated with it previously, um, I'm, I'm not in favor. I, I'd love to see the kids play. You know, I, I agree with you, Jim, in that aspect, but I would feel very uncomfortable because I, I don't, there's too many people that are just too callous towards this at this point. And, you know, just not enough people think that this is real. And unfortunately, there's, you could see going to the grocery store, people don't wear their masks. No. Okay. So of the things that we can all agree on, I would say let's let's make a motion to uh, get some signage or, uh, to properly mark and post the park for reopening and use. Oh, you were wrong there. Motion number one, I suppose. Second. Second. Okay, who made the motion? Peter? P Peter. Because you weren't kind of clear, you said let's make a motion. Oh, okay, so I I will make that motion. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And who second? I think Irene had it by a few moments. Okay, roll call. Peter. Hi. Irene. Hi. Jim. Hi. Okay, thank you. Okay, next motion: allow the community association to coordinate the annual yard sale. Second. So I think so. Call Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Okay. Uh, we had a request for public comment from Brandon Sweeney. Say, so Brandon. Okay. You, sh yep. you should. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I'm trying to trying to navigate this thing. Oh, I was that's actually, okay. I was actually trying to type my. Uh, what, what I wanted to say here. Um, so uh, I just wanted to bring up a couple points. So um, COVID positive cases have been on a downward trend specifically in this area for the last five weeks. Um, I don't have the exact data right in front of me, but um, I, I do brief it daily uh, as, as I work um, with Pima on the National Guard side and the DMVA. So um, this is something that uh, I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, second point, at least uh, so, so concerning, the park and Little League, et cetera, um, uh, we are the only township in, in the immediate area that doesn't have a, uh, our park opened. Um, and, and that's a fact. Uh, second is that um, COVID positive cases in children and teens um, is uh, little to zero. And that has not changed, um, not only in this area, but across the country. Um, so, you know, the, the, there, there's no data, there's no science that, that um, proves that it's an issue. Um, uh, I, I do kind of agree with the organized sports thing because we're not only talking about children, we're talking about uh, families and, and parents that, that bring their children. But uh, I mean, the bottom line at the end of the day is, uh, you know, we're, we're not the, uh, it's not our responsibility. It's not the township's responsibility to, to enforce rules. The best you can do is post signs and, and hope people abide by it. But, um, but folks have to be responsible for themselves. And I think we're at the point uh, in, in this pandemic where um, if people don't want to be around uh, potential infection sites, they're not going to go there. Uh, and, and people that um, are taking the proper precautions they are going to attend and, and they are going to follow the rules. Uh, so that's just my two cents. 
uh, on this specific issue. Granted, are you able to share where you're getting your statistics from? Because I'm not seeing that, that specific trend with children and teens. In fact, what I am seeing, and I work on in a clinical setting on a daily basis, we're actually seeing more uh, children become positive as of late. Yeah, I, I actually pull stuff from a number, number of sources. Um, but uh, uh, I want to say... I mean, one of them is the Pennsylvania Department of, I think it's the Pennsylvania DOH dashboard that they have posted uh, online. I'm not quite sure exactly of the site right off the top of my head, but um, I, I do have a number of other sources that we pull data from on a daily basis um, and, and really breaks down um, into very detailed uh, and specific information. And I can certainly uh, email that uh, that data over um, tomorrow when I get into work. That'd be great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you very much for the comment, sir. Thank you. Okay. Do, do we have any other public comments? Okay. At this time, we're going to move into the items for discussion. Uh, for everybody that is uh, a board member, Sue, Courtney, Jim, uh, I'm going to do the mute all, so you will have to unmute yourself, but as a co-host, you will be able to do so. So that way everybody is kind of level set as muted, so we avoid background noise or other disturbances through the remainder of the meeting. Okay, first item for discussion is the emergency declaration. This was made back in March at the Board of Supervisors meeting with a provision to extend for a period lasting until further action by the board. This was signed on April 1st, 2021 and has been in force ever since. On February 19th, 2021, Governor Wolf extended the COVID-19 emergency order another 90 days. And based on feedback from Andy George at a prior meeting, uh, we don't necessarily need that emergency order to continue to conduct meetings in telepresence so long as we feel that it is a necessity based on safety. Um, based on everything that we have in, in motion, I think, to be honest, we're, we're getting better. Where I'm sure we, that's still gonna be a subject of hot debate and could change at a moment's notice as restrictions start to lift but I don't think we're at the point of lifting that emergency declaration yet and going back to essentially what used to be the old normal. Um, Jim, Irene, what are your thoughts around that? Um, Sue and I were talking about what the capacity is for the meeting room. And I think Sue, you had mentioned it was 25. So uh, we set up for 21 public people and there are one, two, three. Well, five, six of us up front. Six of us. Okay, so that's 27. Mm -hmm. So that would account for, um, if we go by the CDC guidelines, we would allow seven people into the room. That includes everyone, including us. Mm -hmm. So, because now indoor venues are recommended 25%, okay. more than 25% accommodation. Yeah, on, on that lens, I don't think it would be prudent just from a, a availability. We have more than that on the call tonight. We actually have a fairly good turnout on on this evening's board meeting that we would have a situation where people would have to get turned away mm -hmm. if we were to go back to in person. Okay, so I guess we'll move on from that. No action at this time. Next item on the agenda is the Stonecroft Homeowners Association. I'm actually going to temporarily lift the mute for a second. Um, the Stonecroft HOA has concerns about the unfinished roads not receiving proper inspections and preparation fi fi excuse me, prior to the final application of at the asphalt course. Uh, an email and report was sent into the township office earlier this week. And uh, we have a couple of members of the Stonecroft community on the call, as well as Jim McCarthy from McCarthy Engineering. Um, so first and foremost, I'll try to do my, my best justice to give it a quick recap. The Stonecroft residents feel that this, this road by the time they go to do a final asphalt course, will have suffered uh, significant or severe damage and degradation to the point where a, a final coat of asphalt applied on top will not give that road service the kind of longevity that it, it should have had it not been used in the manner it's been used for the, the past probably almost decade. 
Uh, Jim McCarthy, uh, I'll ask you to, to kind of weigh in on this as the, the resident expert on this. Um, but my thoughts are the, the inspection that has to happen before that final asphalt course goes on should properly identify any structural defects or uh, damages that would adversely affect the lifespan of that road prior to it being paved. Yes. In fact, <clears throat> in the fall of 2020, we did an inspection on that and sent a list of all the areas that had to be removed and base repaired and other things done to that to stone to make them aware that this wasn't a just overlay job when they were done. And we told them that, you know, prior a month prior to them planning to do the work to let us know so we could reinspect it at that time and then come up with a new report and actually field mark all the areas and what needs to be done. At this time, they're not planning to do the paving of that road in the foreseeable future because their agreement with the township says they can't final pave that, put the wearing course on that road till the last house is built. Okay, so just to put a, a fine recap on that, it sounds like a lot of the concerns that the Stonecroft residents have about that is, is gonna be brought in on normal process for the inspection that we're not going to let them put a uh, kind of a coat of paint on a, a rundown structure. That's exactly correct. Okay. Uh, Fred, I know you're on the call and you were going to represent some, some points. Is there anything that you would like to cover additionally or, or bring up beyond that? Well, it would have been nice had we uh, gotten a copy of this report because it might have alleviated these concerns right up front, and I'd like to ask for one now. Certainly. So I think that's something we can certainly accommodate. Sure. Um, okay. We'll, we'll um, ask Jim McCarthy to send that over. That would help, I believe. Um, yeah, we had uh, asked Stone Group if we could core drill the roads to verify the foundation. They rejected that on us. So uh, I guess your report will identify what you're going to require to be core drilled or not, or. Um, won't be any core drilling required, or there will not be any core drilling of the road. That is not, that is not in their developer's agreement to have for the township to do that. And we can't enforce that. I already spoke with the township solicitor on that point. Okay. Um, what percentage of the road did you identify as having to be rebuilt? I guess it's the bottom line. I don't really remember, Fred. It was nine, ten months ago, and I'd hate to yep. guess. And basically, we told them that it, you know, whatever was in there was irrelevant. But we were just making them aware of the fact that it was not going to be a just a simple overlay of the cur of the street surface. They were going to have to do substantial base remediation before putting the overlay on and that the final report would be issued uh, immediately prior to them doing the work. Because if it's another year and a half, two years, it's gonna deteriorate more and require more repair than even what we would have seen in September. Okay, that's, um, we look, once we look at your report and we believe, I believe that's, it sounds like it's got us covered pretty well. The, the other concern that we raised is that the, uh, the road surface has been pretty thoroughly filled up with sediment to the point I can take a garden hose, not even a power washer, and hit the road in front of my house, which is only the base coat of asphalt and mm -hmm. pumps out of it. And they have to, also we've instructed them they have to street sweep and vacuum truck to remove any sediment prior to putting tack of fire down. Okay, I have a real problem with that in that sweeping is not going to pull that stuff out of the surface and the tack coat's just going to stick to the mud that's left there, the sediment. Um, well, the method of them doing it, I don't really care how they do it. They have to get it out of there. We said, we said sweeping, vac truck, or whatever else was required to remove it to have clean asphalt surface prior to tackifying in accordance with pub 408 yeah, just, just as a side note, I, not the expert at all, any stretch of the imagination in this field, but I would imagine there's there are PennDOT rules around paving a road that prevent you from putting tackifier down over essentially like silt or mud. Yeah, yes. there's, there's what I'm trying to say is there's far more mil, uh, silt and mud in that road surface than is on uh, below the surface than there is on top. And 
the concern is how good is that going to be if we don't do a power wash on it. But uh, okay, I yeah, guess we, we can't have to we can't the stipulate rules. the means and methods which they use to accomplish the specification. But they have to accomplish a clean surface, free of any sediment, dirt, any type of debris, and it has to be dried. And then we have all the temperature requirements of when they can do it, and you know, forty-five and rising ground temperature over forty-five. So they'll be. We've enforced that on them on every single phase. We made them clean every road. We made them do the base repair on the sub base prior to putting wearing course on um, the entire time since we've been here, which is I guess like eight years now. Prior to us, I don't know what they did, but I, I know what we did. <laughs> Sounds good. Don or Jim, do you have any thoughts? Jim's muted. He's talking, though. So he should be able to unmute himself. I have the... Uh, yeah, press the space bar yeah. down to unmute or... Yeah. Let me, let me see if I can send him a ask to unmute request. He's got a helper. <laughs> How's that? There Much better. Go, we can hear you. Okay. There you go. All right. Great. You may not want to hear me. No. Uh, what I hear sounds good to me. The the basics that we have on a road is that it be clean before you put a lift on it, and the lift should not be put over something that is degraded. And the degradation needs to be removed and replaced with good material in the order that it was supposed to be put in, which is the gravel, the binding course, the wearing surface, which is the fine and the stuff that, that's missing on our, my road right now. Right. So what I hear you say, Jim, is, uh, is that Yes, we're not going to, we're, we're going to have you clean this surface off. The way that you clean it is your business. Okay, I can go along with that. It's better than nothing. And um, the, um, the idea that you're going to remediate the bad, broken areas before you put a new material on it is good news for me. So I'm kind of liking what I'm hearing. Yeah, and I know you said some concerns about cracks. If it was, you know, if it's a crack, if it's a single crack going somewhere and it, it doesn't appear that it's any type of structural failure, we would have them seal that. But, That's right. But we're, we're more of the areas we identified to them so far were areas where we were going to require them to do full depth removal and put new stone base down, put new BCBC, put new binder down, you know, on those areas. Okay. So, Yep. Yeah, we've had them. We, we've had them. I mean, they fought us every other street, but we made them do that every time. Mm. <laughs> yeah, the one, the one thing I can say with absolute surety, if it's something that the township can do to protect or or, or assist, we'll do it. There are certain things that are going to be outside of our, our, I'll say, jurisdiction to do, and in those cases, we'll we'll try to to redirect or help you however we can, but. This is one of the times that we, we can absolutely help. The yeah. concerns that you have are, are warranted and are well within what we're going to be doing to assure that you, you have a, a quality road surface, no different than anywhere else that we would do that kind of work in the township. Yeah, we're not going to let them put a wearing course over a bad sub base. Okay. That's, that's not going to happen. And we can make sure that the manholes don't penetrate through the surface. Well, the, the, all those will have to be adjusted to final grade before they, they right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I know some of them are some of them are set high in their permanent condition. Some are still set low that need to be raised. Yeah, it's kind of like a hodgepodge out there on what was at the right grade and what's at what still needs to be adjusted. Yeah, I know. I run over it periodically. <laughs> I would be interested to know if Don Smith has an opinion. Donald. Yeah, Don, was Don, Don was on. Yeah, I see Don. Yeah, Don was on. He should be able to unmute himself, but I'll, I'll also send a ask to unmute request to Don, see if he'd like to weigh in. We'll give him a, a few moments. There, now I think I unmuted. Can you hear me? Loud and yep. clear, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, reinforce the situation on, particularly on Sweet Burke's Lane, which is the 
the primary hall road, uh, construction access road. Uh, if you walk that, uh, which apparently, uh, uh, Jim, apparently uh, you're, you're familiar with that. Uh, yeah. The, uh, it shows a lot of, a lot of failure, uh, particularly a sub base uh, and failure of the underlying courses. And I, I, I feel that that's what you were addressing. So, yeah, yeah, I like what I hear. We've been concerned about it. Uh, and each year it's just getting a little bit worse. Uh, so, yeah. uh, and I think it's going to get worse, Don, honestly, before they do it. Because, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think they still have, what, 25 or so houses to build out there? Yeah, something no. like that. So I just, no. I just Fred's shaking to... his head no, so maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, More like to, re to reinforce, I like, I like what I hear. Uh, I think you're on the right. I think you're uh, uh, watching it, and that's one of the things we were concerned about. Yep. So I, I like what I hear. Very good. Fred raised his hand. I think. Yeah. They Say, Fred, Fred, you should be able to unmute yourself. We. Uh... Ah, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were two thoughts. Uh, there are only about eight or so lots left to be sold. So mm -hmm. Landmark is probably trying to get out of here by the end of the year. Uh, the second one, which sort of initiated this with me, was there was a paving contractor wandering around the place checking manholes and things. So Landmark has, uh, has been working on this project. And I would, we weren't sure how quickly they intended to move. So that's what initiated this whole brouhaha. Okay. So regardless of how quickly they'd like to move, they're, they're still going to have to conform to the, uh, the confines of the agreement. And part of that is the, the proper application of the road, road surface. Yeah, because if they go ahead and mill it, or if they go ahead and pave it without our approval, we're going to make them mill it all off and redo it all. So, I mean, it's that simple. They're not... We're not gonna we're not gonna play those kind of games. I appreciate that. We had uh, we had endeavored to contact you directly, Jim, and you said due to protocol we had to go through the town, and that's the reason right. things got sent. Yep. No, that's and that's good. So aside from anything else, uh, it best best avenue is to bring it through the board. That way we can kind of proxy it to Jim. But it also adds the the added layer of awareness. We get direct exposure to the concerns of. The, the constituents within Stonecroft. Sue, do you have everyone's email? And I can email you that uh, report. I know you probably have it in their files, but I'll just email you the PDF to, at Stonecroft. Like Jim or Don or Fred, do you have any of their, their emails that you can send it? I would just email it to Fred who emailed the township and then he can disperse it to other people. Okay, does that work for everybody? We'll do it that way. We'll get it to Fred. That'll work fine. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You'll have it either tomorrow or Monday, depending on how long it gets stuck in Bethlehem tomorrow. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jim. Uh, I like what I hear. All right. Good. Okay. If we don't have any additional items on that point, we'll move on to the next one. Um, I was just going to add, Jim, you're going to do a final inspection whenever this is done anyway. And if they didn't do anything that they weren't supposed to, you're going to make them correct it. Oh, definitely. Yeah, but we have to go around when they're done to make sure they set everyone's lock right. corners and any road monuments and street signs. And I know I know Sean was out there because they put the lights in, but they're not working. And they told us they're not hooked up yet. They're waiting for something from the uh, electric company to hook them, energize them. So uh, we, we won't get into the lights. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, trust that, I trust that you'll be on top of it. You're a good man. All right. Thanks. We will, we will be on top of them. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the PennDOT mowing contract. This is a three-year contract that expired December 31st of 2020. Uh, it's the standard agreement that we usually have with them for the, the same square uh, footage and distance on roadways. Uh, the only item worth noting is the total rate has increased a little bit from the last time that we had that agreement made with PennDOT. The amount that the township will receive for performing this service is going to go up from $4,489.59 or 55 cents to $4,809.64. Uh, 
Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the three-year contract with PennDOT for mowing. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Next item on the agenda, and I, I noticed Jim McCarthy stepped away for a moment. We are waiting to hear on the dirt and gravel low volume road grant for the culvert at Marion Drive by where Jacob Weiss is. Uh, Jim, has there been any update or news or development on that? Uh, they I actually just wanted to get an order. I, I could hear you the whole time. Oh, that's no worries. Uh, he, um, they came back and asked us to change it to what Trout Unlimited wanted with some rock veins and an open bottom culvert. That's That's been resubmitted. The Dirt and Gravel Road Committee at the district meets next Wednesday at noon. So that'll be their first time they will have looked at it. Okay. Well, I guess it'll be the first time they'll have to revise one. They looked at the first one and asked to have those other things, kind of like they made us add over at Wintersville Road with the rock veins up and downstream and the silt ledges went on the prior one, and they didn't ask for it. They asked for it after we resubmitted. Okay. So um, it actually increased the – the grant amount request, I think, by $35,000 for the additional things they wanted. So we figured they wanted them. We put those costs all on their side and left our match, the township match, the same. Okay. The optimist in me says that if they've looked it over and they've asked for things to change, that means that they're actually seriously considering it. So we'll, uh, we'll wait and hopefully have some good news in the next couple of weeks. Hope so. Their 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 deadline this year is April first. So they're gonna they're gonna at the March meeting they're gonna make recommendations, and then at the April meeting, and then that should be all the money they're spending for twenty twenty one. So we should we should know something definitive by the end of April. I think their board meeting is the last Wednesday of the month. At one o'clock. So the committee meets at noon and then they bring it to the board at one. Okay. Okay. I don't have anything further on that one. So we'll move on to the next item. It's the uh, culvert on Sheridan Road. This is by Gerald Hoover's Farm, 540 Sheridan Road. Uh, the hole in the road is getting larger. We previously asked McCarthy Engineering to get us pricing. Uh, for our road crew to replace a 12-foot by 4-foot box culvert, including materials. Uh, we did receive an update earlier today. Uh, based on the Barwis Constructions quote and an assumed length, including paving and et cetera, uh, but no base repair, uh, assuming some labor from the township, we're still looking at a, a rough cost of around 90000 which is down by about 39000 over the original estimate. The culvert by itself is still about 36000 uh, and then the end walls are another 12, uh, which right. would be 48,000 just in materials. Uh, the next biggest chunk of that money is uh, in terms of the guide rail installation, which we would want to have done by another, another firm. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but that's largely around liability because if you install the guide rail yourself, you become, and that might, might actually be a question more for Courtney, but if you install the guide rail, if it happens to be involved in an accident, the township as the, the installer would be culpable for that. For anything that didn't meet the current specs, and PennDOT spent it something like seven billion dollars over the next five years, going around the state and making all their guide rail comply with the state regs or the new federal regs. There's really only like two companies that install guide rail around here. No, none of the contractors even do it on their own mm -hmm. for liability reasons. Yeah, I know we had a similar, very similar conversation around a Hickory Road with that right. that slight dip there that we opted for a like beware sign because of a couple of reasons uh one we couldn't get guide rail at the time nobody was doing yeah. it um and it was really really expensive um, well, yeah, guide rail is ridiculously expensive so um yeah i'm i'm pleased with that the only follow-up question i had was of of that uh well, let's say roughly ninety thousand dollar estimate are there other areas within that project where other than the guide rails where we have not leveraged the, the road, the township road crew that we are still relying on other firms that we could potentially shift over to our guys. 
we were kind of relying on the township to do everything other than okay. set the culvert and end walls and do the guide rail. So we figured okay. the township guys would do the demo, excavate out, and have everything prepped. Because typically, with the culvert delivery, they'll take it right off the truck and set it mm -hmm. and set the end walls. And then we figured the township would do the backfill over top of the culvert and actually then do the road bathing. Okay. So... Okay. Or did we try to try to deal with Butch to do the paving or something? Yeah, I was, I was actually going to say. I know we don't we don't necessarily have the equipment necessarily, but we might be able to work something out with uh, another municipality that we're, we are in good good relations with, right? To help us out there. Um, okay, so uh, Irene, I want to connect with you to see how we'll fit that into the budget based on the other road work that we're looking to do. Okay, but I think this is something that is is desperately needed and would be a good use of our, our road crew. Okay, I just need numbers. Okay, so I'll, I'll shoot you an email and we'll connect and, and see where that, that okay. fits into the equation of things, but it's roughly about 90,000. Right. Okay. okay, speaking of road work, the next item on the agenda is the road project 2021. Um, I actually had misread one of the, the outlines in the thing. The Stouchburg road is actually only for a 450 foot section not the not the 0.7 miles so it's actually going to be considerably less to do a, a full resurface on that okay. um, um, so that actually might might be back as a, a, a real tenable thing to to have in there um, I believe the, the rough mental math that I had based on just square footage for 0.7 miles was like 228,000 when I did right. the math for that for 450 foot it came out to about I want to say 28. 28,000. Yeah. yeah. Um, that I think we could certainly keep that in the project along with the other square footages that I had indicated for like the crack ceiling and things like that. Um, right. So um, I think, I think at this point the, the package is with that one minor update or the couple updates that I had given you, Jim, if we can make those, yeah. we can get, we can get that out on pended like immediately. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I know this had been previously approved back when Peter Wallace was on the board before we, we had kind of stopped and said, hey, we should really get some remediation done before we put the, the oil and chip layer over. Right. Uh, so for good measure, I'm going to make a motion to authorize Jim McCarthy to add the additional requirements for remediation to the 2021 road project packet and Post it to Penbin. Second. Peter, can you read the road so I know what to put in the minutes? Yes, give me just a second to open that up. Actually, there might be a better way for me to do that. One one moment, Sue, bear with me. That's okay, because what I have is the two projects, two years combined, and I'm not quite sure what you are talking about. So I have that, that overview from Charlie Paris. Yeah, but that included both years. Yes, that well, that's a long list. That's, that's what I'm... Okay. Yeah, uh, bear with me for just a second. I'm getting to it. Actually, here. Okay. okay, so that should be Church Road, Idris Road, William Penn Boulevard. Sheridan Road, Palatine Place. No, wait. Sure. Okay. Stouchburg Road, Smaltz Road. Okay. And I'll, I'll send you the table 
for when you type up the minutes that, that you have any of the the distances the the foot okay i that we have there rather than me reading okay, them all out again i just want to make sure that you and i are on yep. the same page yeah this is this is everything that is in that that packet that we had previously discussed okay um it totals roughly about 5.45 miles worth of uh, re repaving. Okay. All right. So Peter made the motion. Jim seconded. Roll call. Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Jim Aye. Brooks. Thank you. Aye. Okay. Got it. Okay. While we are on the subject of the road projects, before we go into the next item, um, I'd like us to start considering putting together the next packet, the phase two, if you will, of road work, since this, what we just approved is kind of a backlog of the things from, from last year and the year prior. Um, what I've originally or immediately outlined is another section of Stouchburg Road, Richland Road, Sheridan Road, Scharf Road, Marion Drive, uh, it's T-499, which is either, um, I think it's Ketterman Hill for part of it, and then I think, I can't remember what the other roadway is, but it's it's it splits part of the way through, which is why I just went with T-499, T um, and Reichert. I will circulate that with the board. I ask that you go out, drive it, see what your thoughts are, but my immediate thought is it's uh, a lot of these are high traffic roadways, along the 422 corridor, so they'd be probably the best suited right now for that overlay, for the oil and chip. Um, and it also kind of lends itself into the, the quadrant approach that I'd want to get us into for future road work, where we're doing this lower section. Next year, we can do over here and kind of work our way around the township onto a three or four year cycle. Peter, is this for 2021 or 2022? 2021. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see us do, while we have it, as long as we have it in the budget, get as much of this in this year as we possibly can. Okay. Give me numbers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the big, I think the big thing is we give, I'll, as long as everybody's okay with what I send out, we'll send it over to Jim McCarthy to get kind of a rough ballpark estimate of what we're looking at and see where it fits into the budget. Um, as I'm, I'm not a road professional, I, I could make a... a slightly uneducated guess at cost, but it would better be better to have slightly firmer numbers for the purposes of figuring out the finances. We did get our liquid fuels funding uh, for the first oh, of the year, and good. it was the same contribution as last year, although um, emails had gone out from last year that there was going to be a little bit of a, of a decrease because of uh, funding, So, but we did get the same exact contribution that we had so far as last year. I don't know if the second half is going to be the same. Okay. Okay. If we don't have any additional points on that, I'll move into the next item, which is the Berks County Cooperative Purchasing Council line painting. Uh, we made a motion at Saturday's workshop to authorize up to 20 miles, uh, including double yellow, single yellow, and single white outside edge and crosswalks during 2021. Uh, what I will need to do is I will need to uh, take the list of the 10 miles last year that did not get done due to COVID and snap in any of the other areas that we would like to do. Um, I am of the opinion that we should double yellow center line the entirety of Main Street, William Penn Boulevard from the township line on the Wommelsdorf side all the way to 422. And I believe I had where I put that that number. I actually figured it out. It's it's not an overly long amount of distance either. It it seems much longer than it actually is. So we still have plenty of of other uh, capacity to be able to do double yellow throughout other areas of the township. Um, likewise, I would like to paint crosswalks in that same corridor of of Main Street, if you will, including Conrad Weiser Boulevard. So. Uh, over by Stonecroft at any of the intersections there that that uh, we had posted the uh, the no parking here to cor uh, corner signs. I'd like to put crosswalks there as well as the principal intersections on Main Street, uh, Church Road, uh, Water Street, and Scharf. Jim Brooks, I agree I read. with that. I agree. Okay. 
Like okay. To, yeah. The other thing that I'd like to do, and this is going to be kind of an open question for Jim McCarthy and Courtney, is on Main Street, on the main corridor over there where the, the road is very wide, one of the problems that we routinely have is people speeding. I know one of the mechanisms that you can use as uh, traffic calming or speed reduction is to paint outside lines. Even though the roadway is wider, you can paint the outside border of the road, which helps to visually narrow. Is there anything that would prevent us or prohibit us from doing that on Main Street? Nothing I can think of as long as you, you know, as long as we paint it at a correct PennDOT lane width. Okay. And I certainly would want to do that. Um, I, so. I agree. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything as like, as long as you're complying with the width. Yep. That's where it's really an issue. Yeah. Yep. And that's, you, I think, you, that's going to be one of those. I'm sorry. Go it ahead, would just be Depending on what's adjacent, we'd have to look at for the width, because if there's parking, you have to have a wider lane. If there's no parking, you can have an narrower lane. Yep. Um, so I think you're going to, you're probably going to be a minimum of 12 feet clear. And then if there's parking, you'll probably be 14 to the line and then have to be another two feet clear to a parking space. Okay. So just have to look at it yeah. where you want to do it. Okay. I mean, we can just look at it from Google Earth and tell you how wide it should be. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll take a look. If you could take a look too as a sanity check for me. Sure. Um, I think we have plenty of space there. By just kind of a rough estimate, I think we'll be able to have not only the lane, but we could actually potentially have enough room that if we wanted to paint in like a, a bike lane or something because of it being very, very wide through the center section of town, that I think we've got enough real estate to, to, to do that with. I would not advise painting a bike lane. Okay, noted. Because if you paint, if you paint an actual designated bike lane, you are guaranteed the safety of the cyclist. So you're guaranteeing okay. adequate sight distance the entire length of the route. That's why if you see out in like Rumbazoni where Pendup put it in, they just put the sharrows, the biker sharrows down the road, mm -hmm. marking the route. As soon as you put the line, you're guaranteeing if they're inside that line, they have adequate sight distance everywhere. So I would, knowing Main Street and how the parking and how tight our, our radius curves are, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would recommend painting the bike lane. Okay, noted, but... Uh, the ori original underlying point is I think we've got plenty of space between yeah. outside lane and where the, the cars are going to be parked. Like there's, there's going to be plenty of uh, room there as a buffer. Um, okay. So Jim, Irene, Sue, okay. drive around, see if there's anywhere that you can think of that would be a, a good candidate for additional line painting, whether it's outside edge, double yellow center line, et cetera. Let me know. I'll be doing the same this weekend at some point and uh, taking some notes as to where I think it would be a good good spot. Um, Just keep in mind that I need linear footage. By the first. And I need to know how many cross, I need linear footage for crosswalk, and this must be in by the first. Okay. So we'll, one way or the other, we'll get that. I can, I'm going to, Definitely focus on the crosswalks. That should be relatively easy. I can figure that out. I could probably even figure that out from, from Google Maps, as Jim had indicated, because I know exactly where we want to put it, and I know exactly kind of how it needs to be laid out. Um, so I can figure that out. Uh, the, the single white line on the outside edge, again, I can figure that out from Google Maps because of just being able to look at the road from a like an eagle eye view. The real big thing is the double yellow. I know of some spots that could certainly use it, but extra input is always appreciated because there's going to be things that you guys might notice through your, your daily travels that I, I might not either notice or pick up through through a quick circuit around the township. Okay, uh, one other thing. Uh, quick question, Sue. When when can we get the uh, the cold patch for potholes? It's, they, it's are, they, be... already, they already started making it. Good. I was going to say, I thought it was the first week of April, but... Um, I had called uh, about two weeks ago, and they had just made a batch. Excellent. Um, Jim, Irene, we have potholes galore. Um, <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like to get uh, a couple of loads of cold patch so that the road crew can get turned loose on going around and patching potholes. Um, so I'll make a motion to authorize the purchase of up to three loads of cold patch. Okay, specify which truck. Which one do we usually use? It's a little well, one. Well, 
It depends. The, of course, the bigger truck holds more. Um, Butch had made the comment about filling up both trucks, and I said, I don't think you should do that because if we have a storm and a tree blows over and you got to go get it, and your truck yeah. is full of cold batch, uh, that's not a good idea. Yeah, I'm thinking little truck. Okay. Just by the nature of how we um, tend to use the big truck. The big truck is, um, I think, seven ton, and the little one I want to say is three. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, you know, to lose, use a little truck, they would have to go back and forth more often, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So we could basically just shy of two loads in the big big truck if we did that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. I'm thinking I'll talk to Butch tomorrow and we'll, we'll get the big, we'll use the big truck for that. We'll use the little truck for like storm debris removal. I don't, I'm going to find something wooden to knock on here, but I, I'm hoping we don't have any more snow <laughs> this year. Um, but we'd get, I think, better efficiency out of the big truck, taking it down and getting essentially two loads of cold patch at one time rather than the alternative. Uh, so I'll actually amend my, my, uh, my motion to be uh, up to four loads, uh, I guess it would be two two trips, two loads on the, the large truck of cold patch. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. The other thing I had for roadway related stuff is we should probably get some uh, riprap at some point. The large stones, there are a number of spots that I have seen driving around where there is a uh, bank degradation along the roadway where there's a, a, a rut or a pit. Um, there's one on Canal Road that I think if we don't put some stones in it, it's going to start caving in. Um, there's another one I can't, I think it's on Forge Road around a, a turn that there's a pretty steep drop off there and the, the side of the road is um, not in great shape as a result of it. So I think if we if we pick up some riprap and start putting it strategically at certain places, we can probably head off some problems before they get worse. What about uh, the road coming right into the office, like right before you hit the parking lot? It's getting pretty bad there. Do you mean that, just that was actually part of the grass? They took the pavement <laughs> out. Yeah. And, and so people are making a shorter turn now, and that's why it's getting looking the way it is. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that's just cinder that has been stamped into oblivion. <laughs> it, it was milling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. It's not just me. No, no, no. Oh. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not just you, and it's not intentional. It's just kind of happened over the course of years. Okay. Um, but if you see things like that, speak up. And that's something that at some point we can certainly, if it's like that now, if we ever go to repave that or whenever we go to repave that, that we can maybe structurally build that in since we know people travel that. But uh, that was that was not the original design of that, that roadway. Um, Peter, I don't know, but I'm going to, so I'm going to ask, do we have capability of tamping this into, the, so that it holds better? Not with a, we don't have like a kangaroo, like the, the power tamper, but we do, we do have the ability to hand tamp. One of the things that I think has driven people nuts and Sue, feel free to, to speak up on this was. I think uh, we actually do have one of those mechanical tampers, but the guys don't, just don't use it. They drive over it. Where, where is it? Cause I, I haven't been able to find it. I asked Butch. Okay. I'll talk to Butch. So mm -hmm. Jim, if we have that, we will certainly use it, but I know prior roadmasters instructed that it, the potholes be overfilled so that it would settle eventually, which I suppose has a, a slight shred of merit to it, but I'd much rather pack it and tamp it, even if it's just with a hand tamper. Otherwise you have like eight months of a right. lump, you have a reverse pothole. Uh, and then ultimately if it doesn't settle the way that you fully expected it, you end up just tearing it up the first snowplow that, that goes over it. So we're gonna be doing that a little differently this year to put it lightly. Uh, but if we have the equipment, we'll use it. Otherwise, we have a, a, the, that metal plate that's on a stick that you can use to whack the, the stuff into place. Good. Okay. Uh, if we don't have any more road work stuff, I know I kind of monopolized on that. The next item on the agenda is the Conrad Weiser Youth Baseball. 
Um, we had talked about the, the ball field use earlier. Uh, they would like to use our ball field for the spring and summer. However, based on the, the general consensus of the conversation during public comment, I think we, we still need to send them a letter uh, politely expressing our concerns and that way the ball field is not open, uh, but also expressing a desire to have them there in future times, that we, we value that, that relationship that we have with them and think it's a great thing that we can have within our community. Just this year is unfortunately not, not a good year to do it. I already did that today because you talked about awesome. it on Saturday. Yep. I know we, I know Saturday, we had so. talked about it on Saturday, but just to, to reiterate that mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm still firmly convinced that it's, it's probably not a great idea. And I did get a reply back and they were, they are totally understanding of it. Good, good. Hopefully. And uh, I think this would probably be a good segue because um, I don't think it's actually a formal agenda item. Um, this might be an, a prime opportunity if we have a, a down year this year that we can regroup for next year, both around the ball field and the playground for doing some serious renovations prior to the, the start of the next season. Um, I know we didn't structurally build it into the budget this year, but I know that is something that both Irene and I have a strong interest in doing is allocating a pretty substantial amount to uh, open space renovation, the park, the ball field, the, the, the tennis court and multi-purpose court getting that to a point where it's it's something that's really going to be a good aspect of the community a, a drawing element for people to to go and, and have a good time so jim's on board too because i've talked about it with jim also good absolutely good We're all there. Yeah. so i think we have we have good alignment from the board we have a good relationship with the community association um we have a lot of really intelligent well-versed people involved in this and we have a very nice plan that Jim McCarthy had drawn up and donated to the Community Association. So I think all the requisite elements are coming into place. The last thing is to get uh, enough of a plan written up to get uh, commitments of uh, uh, funding from areas of the community, persons and businesses, and get the grant. If we can get the grant with a, with a, a sizable amount of contribution from the township and from other elements, I think we can make that a, a really genuinely quality space. Definitely. Okay. Next on the agenda is the Aikens accounting audit. They are still working on a few things for the 2020 no, audit. No, 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 they're done. Okay. Well, 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 let me, let me say this. We've submitted everything to them. Um, everything that they've requested. We're just waiting for the, the close out. Sue, have you received any communications since the last one? No. Yeah, I don't think we've received anything since, what, the first uh, week of uh, March. So they haven't re um, requested any uh, further um, information. So, again, I think things went well, and I can't thank Dan, Dan and Sue enough for helping me out. Um, and uh, the nice thing about Aikens is, is that they're there for us throughout the entire year to help us keep things tidy. And if we have any further questions to make our um, bookkeeping, accounting uh, a smooth uh, running operations. Um, if I could add one more thing just to that. Um, I spoke with uh, Rick Rule today. He's going to help us update our program because um, I noticed the program has locked us out of some of the features that we could do previously. He said that's because the program's probably out of date. Um, he's going to be helping us with some general housekeeping items that we had talked about on previous meetings and uh, just keep us moving forward and keeping us on a good, healthy plan. So, um, I've enjoyed working with him. He's going to hopefully help me come down to the office sometime in the next two, three weeks. So we'll get things upgraded, um, up to par, cleaned up, and just keep on moving forward and get, keeping things neat and organized. Okay, very good. Yeah. I, I look forward to hearing about what we need to do for the, the QuickBooks update, because one of the things that I'd like to do as a takeaway on that is make sure that we get it installed on uh, multiple computers. So even okay. if Sue's not going to use it, we should still install it on her computer. Okay. And we should install it on the, the third computer that we have sitting there as well. That would be um, great. The other thing is, uh, once I, I got to come in and run some cabling, but once we have the server installed, that we should have the QuickBook file on the server. That way it's accessible from any of the workstations. And then get into the habit. And I know you're already doing this, Irene, mm -hmm. but backing that up to a USB drive. So the server has multiple layers of redundancy on it, but you can never go wrong with having any, any additional protection you can get, especially it's as simple as backing up to a thumb drive. Yep, that's exactly what we've been doing. So yeah, I'm excited um, to get that done, keep moving forward with it. Okay, very good. 
Next item on the agenda is the website. Uh, we had the staff training that was held on uh, Zoom on March 5th. The recording is available for the, the other supervisors who are not able to be in attendance to view. Um, we are waiting on some account information for the admin profiles for those of us who are gonna be working actively on the website. And uh, I was in contact with Lisa today. There's a, a couple of DNS related changes that uh, I can do one and then I'll probably have to work with them to do the other about getting the, the township website cut over to live. Um, it's gonna be a work in progress for a little bit. There's gonna be things that we're gonna be adding, things that we're gonna be tweaking, certain visual elements that we may wanna see slightly different. Um, it'll be a bit of a growing exercise over the next couple of months, but we'll be able to now cut over from the old website to the new. Um, benefit being is it's gonna be much easier to navigate. Documents are gonna be up to date uh, and all of us have a strong focus on transparency and availability. So we're gonna to try to make absolutely everything conceivable there uh, accessible, whether it's old minutes, financial reports, ordinances, resolutions, et cetera, they're all gonna be at your fingertips on the website. Um, the other benefit is uh, unlike the, the current county website that we're on, uh, we're actually gonna be able to easily make changes to it. So it'll be a lot more real time in the sense that if something gets passed a Thursday night meeting, I could probably even upload it that same night. So I think it's going to be very good. And we're on the, we're on the home stretch within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to, to cut over. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is the noise ordinance. Irene, I will put it in your capable hands to discuss and review that. Um, it, I don't know if everyone's had an opportunity to take a look at it. Um, I know at the prior, at the workshop meeting, we had uh, just mentioned a couple of the revisions. Um, I think everything that everyone requested was put in there. And I, I guess that's it. <laughs> I, I apologize. I actually don't know. I saw, I saw the one that we looked at on Saturday, but I don't know if but I... That, no, that's it. That, that's the only thing that, that I have not added anything since Saturday. Okay. So, the only thing that was added in is if two or more neighbors, two, two or more individuals report it um, as a uh, disturbance, then it's uh, per se in a, a disturbance. If the police witness it, it's a disturbance. And um, I can't think if there's anything else that I had added. You just changed the language of, of uh, one sentence in there too. I think you said within. Mm -hmm. Yep, I didn't say I found a, a couple of yeah. grammatical sort of things. This yeah. is a nitpick. And you um, edited it. it in uh, the document? Mm -hmm. Yep, I edited it in the Google okay. Drive. So okay. uh, yeah. as long as you've made your updates there, I'll, I'll be able to, to see them. Yep. Um, just as a um, real high, go ahead, Courtney. Oh, I was just gonna say, I mean, we were looking at it and we had some comments, um, I wasn't, yeah. I, but I got the draft, I think on Friday. So prior to your workshop meeting, Yes. So, okay. the, Irene, real quick, summarize the changes. So there were a couple of grammatical things just on wording that I flagged, okay. and Irene added a, a, some other wording, which we can send over uh, around okay. uh, our, observation stuff. Our main recommendation is um, to, uh, you had it residential and commercial, is to specifically um, have it relate to your zoning ordinance and the zoning districts, and that way... Perfect. Nobody's going to say it's a home office or mm -hmm. it's a, a, and if you do it that way, also, it does give you the ability to maybe have different um, levels if it's in a more rural part of your township than the, like the main business streets. So what we can do is when you send me the revised one over, we'll just automatically insert that content from the zoning map. And then you guys at your next workshop can just decide on those levels. But I, that was our only main comment is we've seen people <laughs> fight over stupid things in ordinances. Jim's yeah. not in his head. Um, yeah. But having somebody be able to say your parcels in this district, it makes the enforcement of the ordinance substantially easier um, because that's what you're relying upon is that measurement. Um, I mean, yeah, Jim, Jim's been at meetings where we've had people yell about all sorts of things with me. Uh, but yes, if you have a clear definition of what things are, because you do have home-based businesses, you do have farms who people might, somebody will say, well, that's a commercial because it's a business. No, it's not. Um, but you, you want to kind of maybe just put it by the zoning districts. And from what I understand, you guys have quite a nice mix where you're mm -hmm. in your township. So that uh, your zoning ordinance already takes into consideration how far away homes are and things like that um, and what the mixture of the uses are. So like I said, if you get send that over to me, 
I'll incorporate it and send it right back to you, Irene. Otherwise, okay. I didn't have a whole lot of comments. That would just be my main comment. No, okay, so two, two quick questions. So, uh, Courtney, is the is the, the breakdown that's going to go in, like, uh, if you're uh, town center, low, des low density residential, medium density residential, it's this level. If you're uh, commercial, it's mm -hmm. this. If you're highway commercial, it's this. If it's industrial, it's this. If it's ag preserve, it's it's this, that, that sort of breakdown. Yeah, just for those measurement levels that she mm -hmm. had in it. Um, and then if you guys have any specific exceptions that you'd like to incorporate for a specific, uh, or if you want any of the exceptions to not apply to certain areas, you guys then have the flexibility of looking at, okay, this part of our township quiet is more important than maybe other areas where noise you might want to encourage in a business area that might be mixed with apartments or something where people know when they're buying or renting that property to expect some noise. I live in West Reading. I'm not expecting my apartment to be silent. I, I'm just, I know people are going to, I know people are going to get drunk walking <laughs> down my street. Yep. Very <laughs> good, very good example. Very but good if you're parallel. Living, if you're living in part of your township, that might not be the case. So but that's right. What people look at when they look at acquiring property for their business or for their for them to live in. Okay. So, so Irene, did you happen to update the one that's out on the Google Drive? Because we could very easily share share that with Courtney and Andy. Just if that, right. If that's the last one that I sent to you, then that's the, the the latest update, and I would have to look at it again on the drive. But I really, really like that idea. I think that's wonderful. And Peter, you have that zoning map, so mm -hmm. that works out great. Yep. So I know it's I know it's out here on the drive. I will double check to make. The, is it the same link you sent, Andy? Because then I'll just pull it from from that link. I think it's the same one. If you just edit it straight on. I, I, have to, I have to remember if I sent Andy the link, and I know Andy has the public directory link, and I think there's actually he has it's, access. It's a, it's, it's a Google Drive. One. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he, I know he was like, "What is this?" <laughs> he's he's got. <laughs> I, I gave him a bunch of other access too that he that he can see things okay. like our meeting notes and stuff like that and the the okay. supervisor's packet. So I'll I'll double check. I'll make sure that you have and Andy has access to it. But I think okay. that might be the most direct thing is you can you can add comments directly in there and say like, "We need to change this," or you can just drop it right in there, and okay, we'll be, we'll be able to see it as soon as you do it. Okay. We, we tend to, to do things in version so you can see the clean and red line for mm -hmm. our record keeping, but I'll do it also on here for you okay. guys. Fantastic. Okay. I like that. Makes it much uh, more crystal clear. People know what their expectations are. And I really like that concept of people know what they're buying into when they move here. Yeah. Uh, the best example I can give is, is where I live versus yep. if, where I grew up next to a farm. The only noise I was expecting was a cow. But that's right. not the case where I live now. <laughs> right. But you also don't expect a leaf blower at 5 a.m., you know, on a, on a no, weekday. No, no. I, it's, it's, it's just when it's <laughs> summer. It's just when it's summer and there's a, or there's a festival. Right. I knew what I was getting myself into, but I can walk to ice cream. So it's worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. So we'll, uh, we'll get that over to Kozlov Stout, have them do some revision and review on it. And then hopefully by next month's meeting, we'll be able to motion on advertising that for, for adoption. That's great, thank you. Okay, next up is the Marion Fire Company. Uh, they had requested a waiver for some of the building permits associated with uh, some renovations that they're making at the, the fire hall or fire company, I should say. Uh, we made a motion at the Saturday workshop meeting to grant the waiver request for the townships components of the building fees. Uh, Craft Codes has also graciously waived their fees as well, with the exception of the, the UCC fee that is required by the state. Next up is building maintenance. Uh, one of the windows above the garage is falling apart. Uh, in one of the windstorms, we actually lost a pane of glass. Uh, I went and rather crudely sealed it up. It's keeping the weather out, but uh, we should do something about it sooner rather than later because it's definitely not a, a permanent uh, measure that I that I applied. Um, Mike Rail was out to give an estimate to replace both windows uh, in that upper area above the garage. Um, I'd actually, while we're at that, I'd like him to come back out and give us a an estimate to do the windows in both the main meeting room, the AA meeting room, and the file room. 
Um, I figure if we're doing windows, and we've got it within the budget for the, the building maintenance, it might actually behoove us to do a bunch of them at once because the, the simple factor is the, the cost is going to be lower than trying to do them all a cart one little bit at a time. I agree. So, uh, Sue, if I and could... those windows are horrible. Oh, they're, they're bad. They're, they're there largely in name only. Um, <laughs> <laughs> could, we, could I trouble you, Sue, to call Mike tomorrow and see if we can get him back out to do an estimate on that? And then just for the, the sheer cost that's going to be involved, we should probably call a couple other places. I know when we had the office windows looked at and, and quotes given that we had at least two other places for that simple reason. Um, if need be, I can try and make some calls throughout the day, or maybe our reader Jim can make some calls to, to people that do window work, but uh, let's get get some people out to give us some estimates for, for doing that, because um, we're at the point where some of them are actually legitimately starting to fall out of the building. Uh, Mike is coming, he said, at the earliest, April 5th, to do the office windows. Okay, good. Um, let me know when he firms that date up so that we can move the like the computer equipment and stuff out of the office. Well, we need to do that because that uh, is <laughs> okay. Okay, well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Is 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 that okay? Yes. If that's if that's firm, then yes. over the he weekend. Was, he, he said he was putting a kitchen in uh, this weekend, possibly next week, and he said let's count on April fifth at the earliest. But let's count on April fifth. Okay, so if we're counting on April fifth, either this weekend or during the, I want to say probably earlier portion of next week. We'll get you relocated into the, the main meeting room and get stuff out of that room. Well, I, I was kind of waiting till tonight's meeting was over, and then next week I'm going to start moving stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For for the record, I'm I'm not intending to come in tomorrow to to do that. <laughs> um, Irene, you were going to say something? No, I'm I'm available in the evenings usually to come over to do some uh, lifting and stuff. So and cleaning, Sue. I know. <laughs> So and I, and I did um, yeah. I did <laughs> let Butch know that he might be called upon to help move things. So yeah, I could get my boys in there too. So just sure. let me know what needs to get done, and you put a you put a sticky note on it and say move this, and and, and I'll help get okay. it done. Okay. 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 Very good. While we're on the subject of building maintenance, I think we should also try to get some estimates on what it would cost to put drop ceiling in the main meeting room in the hallway as well as the office uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them being that it's gonna be much cheaper to heat and cool the space uh, with the lowered ceiling. Uh, that'll be exceptionally helpful then also with the combination of the new windows as we won't have basically the, the hot or cold going into the outside world. Um, as well as looking at getting pricing for installing a new entry door. The entry door that's there now is um, not the best and is starting to actually pull away from the wall. So I think if we don't do something about that within the next six to eight months, we're probably gonna have a situation where it does itself. And then we're gonna have to have somebody come out and, and do it in a, in a substantial hurry. Um, that might also be a good one for Mike. I think he does, he might do drop ceilings. I don't know. Uh, he might also do front front doors. So while he's there, let's, let's get a, a bunch of various quotes for various things and, and see what what all we can fit into the budget. Um, on the subject of the drop ceiling, one of the things that I brought it up on the, the workshop meeting is I'd like to start outlining uh, some equipment to purchase for whenever we do go back to meeting in person so that we are able to continue to do the, the telepresence meetings, the, the recordings to be put on YouTube and things like that, and to increase the, the overall accessibility of the actual space itself. Um, that's going to consist of uh, microphones and speakers so that way we don't have to project overly loudly or yell for people in the back to be able to hear us. Uh, we can have a conversation at a, at a pleasant volume and have everybody in the room hear it comfortably. Um, additionally, uh, getting some overhead projectors or a screen for in front of the, the, the meeting space. I've eyeballed a couple of pieces of equipment. Um, whether I get reimbursed or not, I've actually picked up one or two of them to test them out to make sure that they would be a suitable fit within the space. Um, the end state goal being that we would be able to do things like project maps or materials or things that we want the, the public that's in the room to be able to see in large on the screen behind us. Um, I think it's something we can, we can certainly do and we can certainly do it at uh, 
a, a price point that isn't outlandish. We can do it uh, very frugally if we do it intelligently. Um, so I'll be setting out some some architectural drawings and things like that to the group for review. But uh, I'm thinking we can we can make that a really nice space that is, um, I, I don't want to say even contemporary, but top notch compared to a lot of the other uh, municipalities where we'll have a good AV space, both in person and as a recording to be shared later on the internet. Next up is the PSATS Virtual Conference Workshop Pass. Uh, PSATS canceled their convention, but will be offering the workshops virtually. The cost is $99. We made a motion at the Saturday workshop meeting to allow Sue to attend these. Uh, so, Sue, you'll have to let us know how they are. I will. Okay. Next is uh, we have received a complaint uh, about Stouchburg Road and Catterman Hill Road. Uh, the complaint was around uh, concerns around accidents, the frequency in which there are oftentimes near misses, as well as speeding. Um, there was a little bit of a, an email conversation that circulated between uh, some of us and Jim McCarthy, and uh, ultimately one of the one of the asks was about, about putting stop signs in. I don't think we're going to be able to meet the warrants required yeah. for stop signs there. Like there's there's no visual obstruction other than the one direction where there's the residential property, so we're not we're not going to have a, a good amount of traction there. The other aspect is stop signs generally are not speed control. There are places where stop signs might have a, a beneficial impact for that, but they're not principally used for that. Um, so the, the little bit of conversation that ensued after that was about potentially putting in uh, like caution intersection up, uh, upcoming signs or uh, caution pedestrian signs. Um, that might also be uh, while we, or on the subject, we rewind a little bit, that might be a good one to paint crosswalks mm -hmm. on as well so that you visually, as you approach the, the roadway, you know that people could be crossing. Um, Jim, Irene, I know you were carbon copied on a lot of that. Um, what are your thoughts about putting some like intersection ahead, pedestrian crossing signs, and then supplementary uh, putting in the, the crosswalks at that intersection? Definitely, definitely. Anything that's gonna... Uh, give people the visual and know that there's a, a troublesome intersection ahead. I agree. We might also want to ask the police department if they can put some kind of a, a I don't know what, what you would call it, but those ones that they measure your speed based on how fast you cross over the little tubes. The, uh, little tubes, yeah. And yeah. uh, hand, hand out a few tickets. That'll get some attention. I'll have to see if the Tulpahawken police is able to speed trap like that. I drove out there and it is, I can see where there's a problem for the school bus drivers, especially. Oh. Yeah. And one of the concerns they had was the there's small children that have to walk that way and have to right. cross that road. So if you have somebody who's not paying attention to speeding, it's, we're, we're fortunate that we've not had an issue and I'd prefer we, if, if we know about it, let's take some steps to avoid having it become an issue. Okay, so I'll, I'll add that to my list. Um, Jim McCarthy, are, do we need, do we need a, any sort of like motion or anything like that to authorize you to, uh, just, I, I don't know, just for the sake of, of good, good practice and good form, I'll make a motion to authorize Jim McCarthy to uh, draw up proper placement of signage for that intersection at uh, Stouchburg Road and Catterman Hill Road. Second. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. While we're on the subject of complaints around roads, uh, Jim McCarthy, uh, we had previously sent something to the homeowner and the, the immediate street address, the, the road intersection eludes me, but it was the place where we had placed the- 676, uh, 676 William Bannon, I think. That's, I think that's, that's the right. one that was the one with the boulders. Yeah. Yeah, They're, the boulders are still there. So what I would like us to do is let's keep an eye on it over the next couple of weeks to a month now that the weather has started to turn. I can't begrudge somebody for not wanting to move some insanely heavy rocks over the winter. But now that it's warmer, if they don't move it, we should send them another letter saying, Seriously, okay. you need to do this. And if at some point they don't do it over the next, I don't know, maybe two to three months, 
that's when we as a board need to discuss taking some uh, more firm action on remediating that because the, the rocks are technically in the right of way and present a hazard. Okay. So what do you want to give them like wait till the middle of the month if they haven't done anything, send them a letter before <clears throat> so they've had it prior to the meeting. Yep. I think that's, I think that's my personal stance is let's give them a little bit of time, but then let's send them a letter. So if, if we can time that so that we have that out before the next meeting, I think that would be fantastic. Um, Jim, Irene, what are your, what are your thoughts on this so that I'm not just. No, I agree. Know, okay. I agree. Maybe I'll send them a letter on like April 10th saying you haven't moved the boulders. We need to move prior to, and I'll have the date prior to your, the day prior to your board meeting. Okay. Um, with, let, let me actually, let me backtrack just a second. With the, the, the size of those boulders, I know it's probably not gonna be easy. He may have to go and rent something. I would say let's, let's, if we send it on the 10th, rather than giving them until the April board meeting, let's give them until the May board meeting. Okay. Just, just, just to be fair, because I know if I had giant boulders on that, if I was given like 12 days, I'd be like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to do this. <laughs> um, okay. So just as a polite approach, let's give them the fair chance to, to do it before we, we take the gloves off. Would you like it to be a nice letter or have a little teeth to it? Better? I'd like it to be polite, but firm. I, I have yeah. the utmost faith in you being able to, to execute on white glove with a brick inside. Gotcha. We can do that. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Uh, last item on the agenda, if we don't have any fur further on that point, is the Act 537. Uh, we had previously received a letter from the DEP in response to our memo that was uh, not exactly what we were expecting or hoping for. No. Uh, but with that said, we do kind of have a path forward where we think we can still get traction under what we consider to be common sense. Uh, so the next step would be to perform the income study, which would lend credence to our concerns around uh, fundability and affordability um, and to get the letter out to the property owners about the pump out schedule. Um, it is on my list of things to do to call Alan Madera. I, I'll take full ownership and, and responsibility for that one. I have had no chance prior than like nine o'clock at night to make phone calls outside of work. And I don't think Alan wants to talk to me at 9 PM about the, the on lot letters. So Probably. Yeah. So with that said, I will be making a concerted effort. Uh, I actually took some time off of work to attend the dirt and uh, low volume gravel road seminars on, I think the, it's the fourth and the fifth to the fourth and fifth and the fifth and sixth. Yeah. Whatever those two days are, I took days off of work to attend those. So I'll be on that with you. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I will conceivably have some time and Irene might have some time too, where we could during the day talk to Alan, run okay. through the letter. Yeah. I think it would be a, an excellent use of the time, but we can get that out there. Um, one of the things I know we had kind of talked about it in the past is we want to stress to Alan that even though the ordinance says like you're supposed to have pumped out by a certain time, of the knowledge of it hasn't been super widespread. Some people are aware of it, some people aren't. So I personally, and I think Irene and Jim are, are of like opinion, we don't want to be overly draconian about this. So once we send the letter out, we want to give people fair time to react. And if you if you're in phase one and you were supposed to pump out last year, uh, we're not going to split hairs about that pump out this year. If you were in this year and you go into like April or May of next year, okay, this by the timing of it, we're not, again, not going to split hairs on it. What we're going to tell Alan is if people habitually ignore you, if you reach out to them and say, hey, this is supposed to be done by middle of June and middle of June rolls around, you, you contact them again and they just completely ignore you. That's when we want engagement. I think a lot of people, once they know this is something that they're already doing periodically or should be doing periodically, it's just going to be, ah, okay, I did that not too long ago. That kind of bites or, ah, uh, yeah, I'm overdue for it. I'll, I'll get it done. That will, I think we'll have a, a pretty good amount of conformity to it, but we might have a little bit of unpleasantness. But um, Irene, Jim, anything that you'd like to add on, on top of that? No, I'm just waiting for Alan's input to see what else we could do. Okay. Um, the other aspect of that is uh, once we've gotten the income study and we have some, some actual detail around the state of our systems in the community, uh, that will hopefully lend credence to a lot of the concerns that we have. It will either very firmly confirm or deny uh, some of the, the thoughts that we have, and we'll be able to move forward on what is the, the absolute best for the community over 
like I said, an aggregate looking at a 20 year period, what's actually going to be best based on actual conditions, actual documented fact. Um, the other thing that I know, Jim, you're looking at is uh, how many EDUs are remaining in availability at Womelsdorf. Uh, because to put it lightly, if Womelsdorf has a certain number of EDUs and they're, re or they're allocating a certain amount every year, there may not be capacity for what we have outlined in our plan. And that would necessitate a change to the plan by its very nature. Right. And I've been communicating with John Muir, who's the solicitor. And actually, even today at 530, he finally emailed me and copied Kevin Conrad and asked Kevin Conrad to get me that latest numbers, um, where they are now, plus what John F. Martin is buying, because apparently they're buying a large chunk. Wow. Um, so I guess that's going to take a little while, but at least we want to know what's going to be that leftover that, so we have that in our... Yeah. You, know, you said if they only have 120, that changes what we can do. Yeah, I think I still am a firm believer that yeah, I know there's a lot of people that would, would want us to, to hard pull the plan and things like that. And it may seem like a, a good good reaction, but there's yeah. a lot of unintended consequences that go along with that. And I think that a lot of people aren't, aren't thinking the long picture out. Yeah. Um, I think if we can, we can still go the, the olive branch route before we, we would have to consider digging our heels in and, and taking any sort of stand um, simply by demonstrating good faith and goodwill. And we're not just stalling. We're not just trying to, to welch out on, on having to do what's legally required. Um, we actually have well-founded, well-documented, confirmed concerns. Uh, I think that's going to carry a lot more weight in the next, I don't know, maybe six months to a year as a lot of the, the information trickles in than what we have now. I think our, I think our concerns are well-founded and common sense, but I, I'm, I'm agreeable to it, recognize that everybody's uh, perception and opinion is going to be different. Yeah. Um, so I look forward to seeing what the EDUs are and I, I look forward to the income study and any of the other information that we have. Um, Jim, prior to the meeting, I know you had sent over some some of the funding sources, just right. as a, a general reference for us. Yeah, um, what's current, what's currently out there for a sewer project, and you know that that there's some there's some that are always on there, like Penvest and RUS, municipal bond, municipal loan. Uh, there's some that drop in and out, but mm -hmm. that's that's what's currently available right now. We tried to reach out to some of the lesser known, non consistent ones because. We know what PennVest and RUS want, um, but it's been very difficult to get a live body to call you back from any of those agencies. We've just left voicemail and email, you know, and, you know, we don't know the person at some of them. So um, we, we feel like we've left, you know, dozens of messages and we haven't gotten a live person yet. Okay. It's like the DMV on steroids. <laughs> Uh, that's, I gotta say that's, that alone is kind of not comforting about the whole funding thing. But, um, the question that I had is a, a number of them, a number of them alone. So a lot, number of them are grants, a number of them are actually, I think one of them is grant or loan. Um, are there, yeah, yeah. Are there ones in that mix of things that if you get one, you can't take the others? Uh, generally no. Okay. Because I know with what, what was what was it, Irene, that we were looking at? Was it something with the playground where if you took one, it was something with the playground. If you took this particular grant source, you you made yourself ineligible from taking any of the other ones. Um, well, I don't recall. There was, uh, I'll have to think, think back on a, it. I think that was the DCNR grant. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that was the DCNR grant that if you took that, you couldn't take the other ones. Whereas if you took the other sources, because like I actually, I sat down and I tried to figure out, okay, Dollars and cents wise, does it make more sense to go after these four, or does it take make more sense to go after this one? And it, I think we we came to the conclusion the DCNR grant is still the best bang for the buck. Um, but uh, as that actually would be helpful if we know that okay, you you don't preclude yourself from being eligible for any of these other ones. That actually exponentially opens up because uh, there are five uh, on the list of thirteen that are, are grant. Right. Uh, uh, four that are 100% grant, one that's a mix of grants and loans, and then another series of, of loan offerings. Right. Um, so the big the big thing is we know that theoretically, theoretically being the operative word, grants are never guaranteed, but 
theoretically, there are some sources for funding. Our next step is going to be the income study, um, which do we would we authorize that with with you or how would we go about conducting the income study? Uh, what you would normally want to do is start contacting one of the agencies. And I think, you know, probably the one to start with is PenVest because their income study criteria everyone else takes. So if you were to start the process with PenVest and potentially, you know, they say, you know, they get the income study and say, we're going to give you X grant, X loan. Now you, have the, now you have the income study to potentially then go apply for those other grants to try and close that gap and get additional grant money. Okay. Uh, so, but you so, want to, you'd have to have like a, yeah, basically like a pre app. Well, we used to have a pre application meeting with them. I guess it'll now be a pre application zoom, but. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, better than uh, Skype. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's definitely better than Skype. I think smoke signals are better than Skype, but yeah. Um, uh, Okay, so it sounds like we, what we'd want to do in order to get that income study information for whatever we use it for, one one direction or the other, is going to be PenVest. We're going to want to strike up dialogue with PenVest. Right, and that, that'll be the first thing they'll tell you. You know, they'll say, generally, what's the dollar figure of project and then we need to get your income study. And the income studies are only good for two years, so, you know, we won't. But I think by our timeline, we probably have... If I remember right, we had 30 months of funding securing, and we're probably, what, about a year into that? So we got about a year and a half for that. I, yeah, I want to say, because that was one of the things that I, I had, of the many things that I asked for, that was one of the few things that found traction with the other right. board members at the time was extending the funding period out. Yeah, um, I think we stretched it out to like month 42. For I, I want to I, I actually say, like, I want to say it was something – a little longer than that. I'll have to look. Um, okay. I mean, I have that schedule. I can, I can pull it out of the plan and email it to everyone tomorrow. Yeah. I want to say it was like, it was either like 48 months or something like that. Cause I think it was basically either like four or four and a half years. I may be wrong. Let's, let's absolutely fact check me on that. But I remember uh, pushing for a, a longer period around concerns of like, one of my principal concerns is around affordability. I don't want to have people be forced into paying for something that's going to force them out of house and home. If we're, if we're not going to, to play ball in any of the other things I'm asking for, let's at least give us more time to try to find money. Um, so let's check that. But regardless, I think the best thing would be, um, do we, do we just reach out to pen invest directly or how does, how yeah. does that work? Okay. Yeah, um, you know, I typically, I mean, the Townsend can do it. I can do it. Courtney can do it. Whoever, you know, can do it. Um, that we have a project that we'd like to talk to them about. And then they'll, they'll usually send you an email that says, write up the general scope of the project. And basically, we give them the 537 plan and okay. you know, potentially update any cost or the changes. Of course, all construction materials are through the roof right now. Mm -hmm. um, that, and then, <laughs> that actually might work in our favor. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe, we, maybe then they drop down by the time we build it and we have plenty of grant money. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But um, uh, then basically you send that scoping application in and then they come back and say, okay, now do your income demographic study. And then everything kind of sits while you do that. Okay. So Irene, Jim, if you don't have any objections, I'd like Jim McCarthy to make kind of the, the introduction, the handoff. Okay. For, okay. for us to pen Penvest. Penvest. Pen pen thank you. Penvest. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Okay, and that is the last item on the agenda. Can um, I add something, Peter? Absolutely. To the agenda. Absolutely. You mentioned you mentioned in the in your last sentence there about being habitually ignored. There's a couple <laughs> of properties in the township that have been turned into junkyards, and we have been habitually ignored about cleaning them up, and promises have been made and not kept. I believe that we sent out a, a letter notifying them that it was time to clean those properties up. Mm -hmm. And to my knowledge, and I drive by one of them daily, uh, there's no progress being made. The one I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask Courtney, what is our next process for getting some, something accomplished after years of them ignoring us? So Courtney, before, before you jump in, Jim, the last thing, I know which property you're talking about, 
we had authorized uh, Kraft to pursue legal action through the district justice on, on that particular property. And how much time does he have to do that? I will have to check with Kraft and see, but it's like any other court proceeding, in which case there's, there's going to be a, a process involved and potentially enforcement actions after that. But um, the wheels are already turning on the next step because of us not seeing the kind of results that we have wanted to see over the long, long term. Um, I, I would imagine at some point, and, and Courtney, this is where, by all means, please weigh in. But uh, I think so, the next action is if we don't get traction with the enforcement aspect of it, that we could, as the township, go in and remedy the problem, so to speak. Do so you first want out? you need to make sure that Kraft actually went to the magisterial district justice and pursue that remedy mm -hmm. um, because you need to do that step and make sure that happened before we can move past that. Mm -hmm. um, there should be a judgment. There needs to be steps that way. Follow up with Kraft to make sure they actually went to um, the district justice. And if they do, make sure they copy Andy and I on any results and that way we're kept up to date. Okay. Or I, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's not that it hasn't happened; it's that it's happening that we haven't gotten well, feedback yet because it's not it's not moved through to that point of like actually of having having the hearing. The, well, hearings are happening now. Oh no no no! I, I don't mean that they're not being held. I mean that we just haven't the hearing has not occurred yet. Okay, typically they go pretty quick. So okay. follow up with Kraft. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll follow up with Kraft. But that was where we had left off from that executive session, Jim was to move forward on uh, kind of the next phase of actually enforcing the IPMC on a couple of the properties. I just want to make sure that once we have a, a judgment from the district magistrate, and of course, you know, we're going to be ignored again, that it'll be time for, for uh, Courtney and Andy to take action and get this thing accomplished. And if we have to go in and do it, they can lean him and start selling his furniture out of his living room as far as I'm concerned. It's ridiculous. Hopefully it doesn't come to that, but the the, the proper process is underway. It's it's not necessarily as fast as I think anybody would would like for certain reasons, but the we are going through the, the requisite steps to make sure that that's done and done right. Thank you. Okay. Moving into the supervisor's comments, uh, the only item that I have that we have not previously discussed is the police report. Uh, looks like it was a relatively quiet month. Um, we had a 21 EMS fire advisories, which is a little higher than normal, 58 security checks, which is right about where it is, nine police assists, three motorists assists, two court appearances, and uh, we actually had a, a slightly higher than normal amount of traffic accidents for the month. There were a total of seven traffic accidents that were filed. Um, other than that, everything else is, is pretty much business as usual for the, the Tulpahawken Police Department. Uh, Irene, do you have any comments? Um, I was curious if anyone else had the opportunity to take a look at the American Rescue Plan funding for townships. I know Sue um, put it up there and it's in uh, Google Drive as well. Has anyone else taken a look at it? Was that the, the CHIRP one? Or was that, oh, that's no, the, the COVID-19 no. fact sheet. The, okay, yeah. Um, I skimmed it. I did not get a chance to read it through in its entirety. Okay. There's there's not much there. Um, PSAT's website um, also gives us information as to how much funding we're going to be getting for the township. I know, I think we briefly meant, touched on it maybe at the workshop meeting. Um, it looks like half the funding will be coming in in June and the other half will be coming in June, 2022. Uh, what's interesting is it's very brief. Um, there's gonna be more direction as to what can be done with the funding. Um, we cannot use it for roads and it cannot be used for bridges. Um, it looks as if we're able to do things related to infrastructure, as long as it is to the betterment of the community with respect to any changes we wish to make. Um, how we were impacted with COVID-19. So there's more guidelines from reading that particular fact sheet and going through the slides of the presentation that was made because I didn't have a chance to listen to the um, um, audio. I think Sue, you had listened in on that Zoom. Uh, I, I listened to yeah. um, the first one yesterday and I actually stayed today and listened to the second one just to see if there were different questions asked. And um, I mean, they're both like an over an hour long, but they're, they're 
pretty helpful. Um, basically, they said, use your imagination. If you can relate it to COVID in any way, uh, it's probably going to be on there. PSETS is waiting for direction from the Treasury. The Treasury is going to hand down regulations and hopefully spell out a little clearer what money can and can't not be used for. So I guess, I mean, for me, this kind of goes back to part of the wish list of restructuring the office and really considering the entryway and so that if there's a vestibule or something so that this isn't going to be the last pandemic we're going to encounter. Hopefully it might be another hundred year gap before this happens. I don't know if the building will be standing then, but, but using, you know, kind of having the foresight to create an entryway so that there is some separation from the public from Sue sitting in the office because right now there's nothing. It's it's a it's a Dutch door, um, something that will create a safer entry point for Sue from safety perspective as well as like a health concern, so that we could restructure the office so that people can enter in and and use the space a bit more efficiently. I know we had talked about that. So I mean that that's one thing again. I want to throw it out there. We could I know we've tossed around that conversation, but here we're going to get funds dumped into our lap basically so that we could do that. Um, and, and that's something I, I think we could consider. It, it's a nice bit of a chunk that, that we didn't think we'd get. And it's 190,000 and a little bit more in change. If we're getting half of that, I mean, that's, that's really a, a nice amount that we could do. If the funds aren't used, um, they, they have to be used by 2024. I don't see that as a problem. <laughs> uh, but I think there's gonna be some prohibitions that we really don't have to worry about. And again, um, the biggest thing is to, they can't be used for roads and they can't be used for bridges. Right. But if there's something that we could think that is COVID related, that's going to improve, basically, I think our health, safety and welfare, mm -hmm. as well as improving um, stuff for the public. So I know, Peter, you had uh, pitched the AV equipment. Mm -hmm. Again, I think that might be something that might be covered because it's going to allow better public access. We're going to be able mm -hmm. to continue our Zoom conversations. It's going to improve just overall uh, better communications with the public in general. And I think all this kind of stems out of COVID. So I think you're right. The, some of the questions that were asked um, for both sessions was about audiovisual equipment. And they said, if you have changed the way you've done your meetings, absolutely, you can, you can mark those costs as COVID related and spend that money on that on audiovisual stuff. That's um, fantastic news, actually, because that, that's actually going to be a, a huge benefit for a lot of the stuff that I was hoping to do anyway as, as a mm -hmm. kind of a betterment yeah, exercise post-COVID. People, people ask the questions, you know, we bought a bunch of laptops so our people can work at home. Can we, um, you know, is that a cost that we can use that money for? And they said, absolutely, because anything COVID related, and they, they ended up saying pretty much, use your imagination <laughs> um, if it's in any way COVID related you know, that, but they did yeah. say, they did make it a point over and over to say, make sure you do proper accounting for it because you're going to have to report back to the state how you spent this money. Yep. So I think that would be a situation where we'd want to set up maybe a separate code of accounts specifically well, they, for PSATS, that. PSATS is actually trying to partner with, I, I understood it as some kind of accounting software to just track you're spending for this money. Okay. They, they don't have the bugs worked out for that yet, but that was the gist of what I got out of it. Yeah. Okay. Even so, even internally, it might not be a bad mm -hmm. idea to set up another code. And then like, for example, if we have like the AV equipment, the office renovations that we have that se separately tracked under one main code of accounts. Yep. And it's easy enough to create a, a line in the memo over what it is specifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you had mentioned earlier about the door to the entry. So now if we're, we're considering a reconfigure over how the building is used, we want to have things so that it's safer for the public to come in as well as safer for staff to be in there so that there's better air movement. There's just, it's just a, a safety concern that, that, you know, Thank God that you are competent and we were able to set up these Zoom conferences the way we did. Otherwise, we'd be on, on phone calls constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is it, it's so much more interactive when we see each other's faces. You know, it, it, it feels a little bit better than because we're all so distanced from each other. But especially, you know, for you, for, well, for me, you know, still being a fairly new board member and Jim being a new board member, it was it was very disruptive. But, 
you know, again, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that the information that's on PSAT's website, you know, you click on it, it's very, very brief. Um, it's very easy to read through. I'm still waiting for more guidelines and I'm looking forward to, to tracking the information and, and doing what we could do best to, to get that. And I guess if the money's coming in June, it, it, it's starting to get some contractors in, come take a look and, and kind of see what we want to do. I, I need some ideas. I think everyone needs to throw, you know, pitch some ideas what we can do. I've got some, I've got some pretty large ideas. I still like the idea of converting the garage area over to office space. Yep. Because we've right. got plenty, plenty of space back there where that, the, the entry door for the road crew could become the new office front door. And I still think we should replace the, the side door, the current main entry door. Uh, and that, and that could be essentially kind of a, a side entrance for getting into the, the meeting space on meeting nights. And the, what is the current office could potentially become like the, the supervisor and uh, treasurer office space. Not that we want to necessarily move you away from Sue. I'm sure that oh, the, no. company, the, <laughs> the company's <laughs> no. appreciated. Um, yeah. But there could be a dedicated space where we have some stuff specifically set up so that our clutter doesn't necessarily disturb Sue. I don't um, have the clutter. I, I have the clutter. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, clutter for you. I but, clean uh, my desk. <laughs> yep. But uh, I, th I think it would be a, a good use of that space, especially because some of the other conversation we had had was around putting it uh, like a new salt shed in and then trying to get some some better space for the actual trucks and equipment and things like that, where it can be better stored and better maintained, trying to get some things that are purpose built for that. So if we have a, we have stuff built into the budget for uh, building renovations and we can use the COVID money for that, I think that's an excellent thing. We can get a, a lot done in, in ways that we would not have had otherwise available to us. Right. And it's also like uh, understanding for the public, everyone likes to think that there's these unlimited funds and, and we don't have unlimited funds. And, and again, this is more like a FYI to anyone who's watching this. We can only use certain monies for certain things. So we don't have this unlimited bank account. And so certain funds are designated for certain projects and when we're restricted under the law. The other thing I just want to add to that, again, for general public education purposes, myself, Peter, and Jim have not taken a dime from the township for any of the hours that we have spent working at the office, at home, et cetera, et cetera. And if, if you want to give a rough estimate, I think we've saved the township at least fifteen to $20,000 by not taking any money within the past year, oh, year and a half that, that, or so, you know, that we've all been on the board. So, you know, over, over my, my lifetime of being on the board, you know, total years, it's a considerable amount of money. If you think about it, I mean, if you, if you want to say an average of $5,000 a piece, $15,000 for six years, that is $90,000 that we are not taking from the township that we are essentially giving back to the public because we are not charging the township for our services that we are legally entitled to do so. So just want to throw that out there to the public so that they're aware of that. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I know, I think I speak for all of us. I didn't get involved for the, the money, the glitz or the glamor. I got involved to try to, to help make a difference and make yep. situations better for everybody mm -hmm. in the township. Yep. Okay. Any other comments, Erin? No, no. I, I know you had mentioned earlier. I, I want to see the playground get done. I wanna, I wanna put all my efforts in towards it. I'm hoping this summer, Jim and I can uh, get some people um, out there, get some estimates, and and work with the township association, and and get that ball really rolling and seeing good progress there. I, I want the kids to come back. You know, I, I know I took my kids a lot to the park when they were really little, and. Uh, you know, it's something that I enjoyed as a mom and, and being out in the fresh air. So that's something I really want to focus on. Absolutely. I look forward to next year really attacking that in earnest, trying to get the funding for that and the grants. We will. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I think our park, nothing against our park. I love our park, but um, – it, it needs it, and I think that's it's fairly evident. So grant applications are, are going to be, I think, favorably looked at compared to a lot of other places that may be asking for money. Um, Jim, do you have any comments? I just like to pass out some thank yous. I want to thank Sue and Butch and the road crew for doing their usual outstanding job. Peter, I think you need to be thanked for your technical abilities and bringing us into the 21st century. Uh, you are just amazing with 
with your technical stuff. Thank you. And uh, Dan and, and Irene getting the books straightened out. Uh, they weren't they weren't managed the best in the past. <laughs> and I think you guys have really done a great job of straightening everything out. And I want to thank Courtney for filling in for Andy tonight. Uh, thank Jim for doing his usual great job. And I think it was great that we had so many residents on tonight. So I'd like to thank them for participating and, and uh, providing input and hope that they'll come back and, and we'll continue to get more people involved on the Zoom. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'll happily come back. It's, you it's, guys see me. It's been great so far, so we'd be happy to have you back again. <laughs> uh, do you, do you have any comments? You're a lot quieter than Andy. <laughs> It's a lot better to look at Andy, too. <laughs> Jim! <laughs> the hair, the hair. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, we well, usually joke at other meetings that I, my head is warmer than Andy's. Um, Definitely. So <laughs> that's, a, that's usually the joke. Uh, I'm happy to attend. You guys have been great. So if you ever need extra help or anything, I'm always happy to attend a meeting. Awesome. And uh, the office over. Yeah. <laughs> what we're moving the office <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh jim mccarthy do you have any comments nope i think we covered everything okay fantastic sue do you have any comments None. okay at this time i'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting it is now five or 905 p.m second roll call peter hi irene hi jim Hi. All right. Meeting adjourned. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Have a good night and uh, yeah. take care. Good Stay night, safe. Everyone. Okay. Good night. Good night.